What I'm going to get into on top of that is this idea that we know, so the cover crops are reducing losses of nitrogen, but then what does that mean in terms of when we're managing <laughs> nitrogen to that next crop, and what are the implications of that? And so in Wisconsin, we've, uh, we're the dairy state, right? So we've got a lot more, we've got a lot of corn silage. And so we have a lot of opportunities to get cover crops planted a little bit earlier. And, and so we've got 4 million acres of cover crops, a million, oh, I'm sorry, of corn, 1 million acres of corn silage. So we have a lot of opportunity to, uh, to get those cover crops planted. So looking at the uh, results from the, the ag census in 2012 shows that, you know, Wisconsin uh, has a slightly higher, in terms of the, the, gra the scale on this is only a couple of percentage points, but generally the darker the shade, the, the more percent of cropland under cover crops. And we have a central sands area that's under, that's irrigated sands, so there's a lot more opportunity there with the types of crops. But just in general, we have a lot more corn silage in our landscape, and so thus we have a little bit more opportunity to get cover crops planted. So uh, what we've done is a multi-site and a multi-year research project. Um, it's funded by the Wisconsin Fertilizer Research Council. And the objectives are to evaluate the growth of fall seeded cover crops and their effect on soil nitrate. Um, so that is uh, following a corn silage harvest and manure application. And also it's important to note that we're working in no-till production systems. And then to determine the effect on yield and the effect on optimal nitrogen rate. So uh, this is the great state of Wisconsin. Uh, we've got, uh, I, I have all four of our locations up, but I'll be talking about our, our results from our Lancaster experiment station. That's in uh, the, what we call the driftless region. So more highly erodible lands, more, certainly a lot more slope to our landscape there. Our Arlington Research Station is, uh, would be very similar in soil uh, type. Uh, in, in, it extends into a lot of Illinois and Iowa. And then our Marshfield site is, is our northern site. And it's a, bit, uh, little, it's a little bit wetter soil, so none of, and none of these sites are tile drained. So we don't have as much tile drainage in Wisconsin as the rest of the Midwest. Um, so this is a system then where we're gonna, it's a corn silage harvest. So we have all of that, all of that plant biomass is removed, right? So then we have the fall manure application, and then, and then following that application, we're gonna plant cover crops. And so we're gonna plant uh, either spring barley, and that's going to, that will winter kill in Wisconsin, but we see it has pretty good growth, but it will winter kill. Uh, when, and then compare that to winter rye that we're gonna have to chemically terminate in the spring. And then we, and I apologize for leaving this up, we do have triticale in there as a harvested forage crop, but I won't be, um, I won't be talking about that today. And then, but comparing that against what happens when you plant these cover crops relative to no cover crop. So these cover crops, uh, you know, we want to evaluate the effects of them on, on the key parts of the production system. One is that erosion control being that how much, how well does the cover, these cover crops grow? Now we're planting them in September, right? So we're gonna get, we're gonna get pretty decent growth and then it's just gonna be contingent on how long the fall is, right? So how much, you know, how much, how well does it grow and how much does it cover? What happens to the, the soil nitrate in the fall? What happens to the soil nitrate in the spring? So uh, for those that are using any sort of uh, soil testing to guide nitrogen management, like a pre-plant nitrate test or a pre-side dress nitrate test, this will be of interest to you. And then, and then obviously identify yield and then where the optimal, uh, how is it affecting optimal nitrogen rates. And I'll say that it, depending on how we put out the fall manure did vary from location to location. So we do have somewhere we're injecting the manure that certainly rips up the soil a little bit more. Uh, there's also these types of manure applicators like an airway where it it, it more, I guess you would say, it more punctures the soil. So uh, the soil conditions that you're planting into can look a bit different uh, after the fall manure application. And we're typically planting, <clears throat> we're putting out enough manure in the fall to, to provide at least 100 pound nitrogen credit that next, we're expecting 100 pounds of nitrogen for that next spring. So we're putting out quite a bit in terms of, it's, it, it should be supplying quite a bit of nitrogen to that next crop. All right, so what about cover crop growth? So, <laughs> You know, when, we, when we're looking across the, the past two growing seasons, we're looking at the, or the, the past three, the fall growth ranges from minimal to excessive, right? So it's obviously where it's completely contingent on, on the conditions. But um, we're getting anywhere between, a, you know, a tenth of a ton up to uh, over a ton of dry matter biomass uh, produced. Um, and that's going to depend on location and per year. Now, certainly the, uh, the fall of 16 and the fall of 15, we had the, I would call them extended falls. Right, we didn't have we didn't have the, that winter kill happen early, so 
in that case, we're seeing conditions like where that's, that's barley that, can, that continues to grow and we get a lot of biomass put on in the fall. But what I thought was good, so we always go out there, we always take pictures of the cover crops and we always take nice pictures of the field, but what do they look like top down? And so as we think about how much biomass there is relative to what does it look like in the field? So I'm gonna show you know, numbers, but what does an eighth of a ton of dry matter look like? So here at our Lancaster station, this is about an eighth of a ton of dry matter bi biomass, um, winter rye, barley, and triticale. And so you can see it's not a lot of soil coverage there. You know, we're not getting, um, we've got, you know, some growth to prevent, you know, maybe some movement, but not enough to, you know, stop raindrop impact, right? So an eighth of a ton isn't really a lot of, uh, a lot of coverage, uh, especially when you're drill seeding, right? And you still have stuff happening in rows. Then you get to about a third a ton, a uh, third, uh, third ton dry matter biomass. Now we're getting, now we're getting somewhere, I think, right? So when you look down on top, this is the winter rye, spring barley, and this is the triticale. Um, where we're getting a lot of a lot more coverage, more of the land, you know, we're, we're helping with that raindrop impact in that case. So, in, just in terms of just visually, a third ton of biomass, I think, can be sufficient to help with with erosion control. But anything less than that may may not be as may not be that beneficial. Then we're getting into okay, this is getting out of control, right? Third uh, three quarter ton to a ton of dry matter biomass. So it's always that trick with cover crop, right? We want enough to provide coverage, but if we don't need all this extra biomass, do we want it? And that's gonna be the question, right? So, but again, but we have here, now this is beautiful, right? No exposed soil whatsoever. So from an erosion control standpoint, it's beautiful, but this means that there's a lot of biomass there to deal with, a lot of nutrient uptake, and now it starts to take some water and stuff like that as well. So, so what happens, uh, what do the cover crops do in terms of fall soil nitrate? And the cover crops do what we think they're gonna do, they take up nitrogen, right? So everyone write that down. <laughs> but in the upper two feet of soil, uh, thinking about that one third ton of dry matter biomass, I think that's going to lead to about a, a reduction in 25 pounds in that upper two feet of soil based on just soil, uh, soil sampling. So we're not measuring what's leached out. So we don't, this is uh, just, a, I guess, a naturally drained field. This is not artificially drained. But where we have then, you know, a third a ton of bi uh, biomass, we're getting that, you know, 20 to 25 ton uh, reduction. We have an eighth of a ton, this is the reduction. Then we don't, we're not getting that much, you know, five, six, eight pounds of nitrogen, not very much. So going from that one eighth to one third is a, is a huge benefit. Okay, so the, the whole idea of this study was like, okay, if we can put out cover crops with our, after our fall manure, in a best case scenario, the cover crops are just gonna take up the nitrogen that was gonna be leached out anyway, right? So uh, that's the best case. So we can figure out how, how, how much that happened. So in Wisconsin, we, we like to use something called a, the PSNT. It's a pre-side dress nitrate test. And it's, a, it's not a perfect test by any means, but it's, it'll give us an indication. And so we can use it to adjust a nitrogen credit in season. Um, so it would be taken at a time where you would go out and side dress your nitrogen. So this is a very popular system if you're putting out manure and then you want to test you know, in season and give that, give that manure some time to mineralize and figure out uh, how much you, you know, if that nitrogen credit, if that nitrogen was there or not. In any case, so if we take, uh, it's just a simple, uh, it's just the nitrate in the upper foot in part per million, and then you can convert that value. These are all based on book values. They're very crude uh, estimations, but then a nitrogen credit of 35 pounds. So basically it's saying what, if whatever you would typically apply for nitrogen, you could reduce by 35 pounds. So uh, this is without the cover crop. But when we compare that to barley, interestingly, we actually had slightly more nitrate in that soil uh, at this one location, and it suggests that there was a 100 pound credit. And that happened at, at two locations um, in this year. Now, what's interesting is that uh, it's slightly greater than the nun, and the barley at winter kills, so it doesn't get as tall, right? It's still relatively green, it has a relatively, relatively low C to N ratio. So it's possible then that it's decomposing and releasing some of that nitrogen early. It's, um, but could, because it's relative to the no cover crop, um, it'd be hard to, I don't know. We're, we wouldn't think that it's necessarily, it's just uh, it, that the nitrogen wasn't taken up. So in any case, but compared to the rye, we always have less, significantly less, and it would basically takes out that nitrate, uh, uh, basically takes out the nitrate, uh, the nitrogen uh, credit based on that side dress test. So does that make sense? So the cover crops are doing what, they're say, what it's going to do, but it's not just taking up the nitrogen that was gonna leach out, it's also taking up the nitrogen 
that was we were hoping would still be there for the next corn crop. So this is this is important to, to think about because if you're using if you're using nutrient management planning to, to guide this, uh, it's possible then we're going to be short on nitrogen uh, because the cover crop took away from what we would expect to be there. Okay, so we can actually uh, if we keep the study going, which we did, we could confirm this with yields. Okay, so here's uh, this is our Arlington Research Station. So this is South Central Wisconsin. So it's a mollusol, very similar to soils throughout uh, Iowa and Illinois. We're seeing a yield drag following uh, both types of cover crops, although spring barley uh, can be, uh, the yield can be made up for. So we go through this graph here. Uh, this is the corn yield, and this is, these are nitrogen rates. So we followed, we have these strips of cover crops, and then we put in different nitrogen rates on the corn that next year. So the spring, uh, so the, let me, find, let me get my colors correct here. The blue is the response curve to no cover crop, right? So we're seeing greater, um, greater yields around you know, 150 pounds of nitrogen. So with, with the, the green is the spring barley. So two things are happening. Well, three things are happening here. One is we're getting slightly higher yields with no nitrogen. At the medium nitrogen rates, we're seeing this, this yield drag in here of about 10 bushels per acre at this location. But what's interesting is if we just simply apply more nitrogen, we can make up for it. Right, so in this, this is a case where it just stole from the nitrogen, and if we just gave it more nitrogen, it made up for in yield. But what's, what didn't, that did not happen with the winter rye. So the winter rye took up even more nitrogen, and you know, so we had a ton and a half of dry matter biomass in this year. And at some point, yields plateaued, and we can never make up that biomass. We can never make up yield by just supplying more nitrogen. And so um, whatever effect is happening here, for this yield reduction isn't nitrogen related. Because if it was, we could just apply more nitrogen. So I call this allelopathy, but the problem is I don't know what allelopathy is. So that's just why I call things where I can't explain it from a nitrogen standpoint. So, so all the other things that could be potentially happening are wrapped up in here, right? So it's not something where, where if we just give it more nitrogen, it's gonna, it's gonna make up for it. So this becomes a bit problematic, right? If, if, the, if, the, if the winter rye is taken away from the manure nitrogen, um, then we, are we, and then we're gonna say, well, then we should, we should supply more nitrogen because we're reducing our manure nitrogen credit. But if, the, uh, if our yields are uh, maybe suppressed a little bit, then that's also going to reduce the amount of nitrogen needed from that corn, uh, for the corn to grow. So, what we want to do is, is uh, so the first thing is, uh, one and a half tons of dry matter biomass is probably too much, right? We don't want that much. Um, and if we do, maybe it's advantageous to harvest it and, and put it into our forage systems. So we are also seeing this happen uh, at other locations as well. Uh, interestingly here, this is the no, um, no cover crop in blue. This is the Lancaster site, so more highly erodible land. The, the green is the spring barley, and so we're seeing a nine bushel yield drag. But you know what's also interesting is that these yields are really good. There was nothing in these plots that would have indicated that there was something bad happening to them, right? If you would have looked at this field, you would have said, these are, these are great plots. If, if you were farming this land, there would have been no indication that anything bad was happening. Uh, I can't say the same thing about the winter rye, uh, where we have si uh, significant yield reductions. Um, and a huge uh, reduction in yield. The trick with this one, the trick with this one was planting. So we had a lot of biomass here, a ton and a quarter dry matter biomass, and we didn't have, a, we, uh, the no-till drill that we had for this location uh, wasn't adequate. It wasn't adequate to get through that amount of biomass, that amount of stubble, and get good seed closure. So uh, this case, is a case I think that could be made up for with improvement in, in management and equipment. So there's that aspect to this. I feel, I, we feel pretty confident that that was what was happening here, although certainly there's a, certainly there's a lot of nitrogen tie-up. But, but yield drags are, are possible. Um, and again, we're seeing the, something very similar at our other locations where the blue is the no cover crop. This is marsh fields, so these are wetter soils. The green um, is the spring barley where we're seeing about a five bushel yield drag. The winter rye had a 15 bushel yield drag. But again, actually in all three of these cases, you know, there was, these were pretty decent yields. There was nothing that looked bad, especially as long as nitrogen was supplied. But there is this potential hidden 
yield drag um, that really would only come to fruition if you, if you were doing studies like this. But uh, that all happened in 2016. But we go to the yield responses in 2015 that we've seen, we're not seeing that same drastic effect. So here's an example from Lancaster in 2015 where we're comparing uh, blue is no cover and red is winter rye. So it does imply that there is, uh, there's a slight yield drag if you're not supplying enough nitrogen, but if you supply enough nitrogen, you can eliminate that yield drag, right? So we can, and then in other cases too, with Arlington, the green is spring barley, and we're not seeing any yield effect or any nitrogen effect in this case. So it's not consistently happening, but we tend to, it tends to be happening when we have a lot of biomass. And so this is a real effect that we gotta figure out how to, uh, how to adjust for. Now I do wanna point out, and, and, I, and I show this when I present this to Wisconsin farmers, yeah, you know, this is my data. It's three, three specific locations, but do others typically see this? And when we go to the, the Iowa uh, on-farm network, they do these strip trials of with and without cover crops and relative to corn, um, so this is, uh, they're seeing across 50 trials, on average, they're not seeing any yield difference between with a cover crop and without a cover crop on corn yield. And the same thing with Practical Farmers of Iowa, where they've seen, so this is data uh, through 2014, so 25 uh, uh, of 28 site years, they're seeing no yield effect of cover crops on, on corn yield. In the blue here, it does represent three of 25 site years, they did see a reduction. So it's possible, but it doesn't have to happen, I think is the case. So how do we avoid it from happening? Uh, keep the biomass low, and if you're no-till, have a really good, be, uh, be a good no-tiller. Be a better no-tiller than I am, for sure. So that's the, that's the, that's the trick with, with, the, with the manure. We don't, or in the, in the cover crops and manure, we don't necessarily have enough data yet to, 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 sh to provide a recommendation for how nutrient management plans should be adjusted. So we're still working on that, and I think we're gonna need quite a few more site years. Um, and then what is that gonna be dependent on? I think so one of the factors certainly could be the amount of nitrogen taken up by the cover crop. But there's two other, there's other types of cover crops that we can grow, right? And how are they gonna affect the nitrogen, uh, our nitrogen management planning? Well, the, so the first, one other type of cover crop we tested is radish. And we just plant, so this would be radish um, planted after winter wheat, so something that we can get, we're gonna get this radish planted in August. And our hope was then that radish would, that will winter kill and then decompose and release that nitrogen for that next corn crop. We had nine, we had three locations and each location we had three years, we had nine site years. And this is an example of, uh, of the type of data we see. Um, the white is the corn yield following radish and the, uh, the black color is following no cover crop. And you can see these, line, these are all right on top of each other. There's essentially no effect. The nitrogen that, was, that the radish took up and when it decomposed, it wasn't releasing it in, in, con in conjunction with the need and timing of the nitrogen uptake of the corn crop. So that was, we were a bit disappointed in that, but I think this also demonstrates this was a, this was a pure stand of radish that we were, we were doing. Um, so it, I think that there may be some still potential for radish, uh, especially if it's grown with, uh, with the grass. And obviously the, most of the uh, promotion of radish is in, in mixtures these days. So in any case, we were a bit disappointed, but nothing bad happened either. It didn't tie up nitrogen, but it also didn't supply nitrogen. Great. So then, uh, then the last bit is then what about the legumes? So the legumes are uh, then having that complete opposite effect where the, nitrogen, uh, the legumes decompose, they have a much lower carbon, nitrogen, uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio, and it's supplying nitrogen uh, to the next corn crop. So we have an example here from uh, Janesville, that's uh, uh, South Central Wisconsin also, in 2010, and what we have here is, this is corn yield and nitrogen rates. And what we had was a, it was a winter wheat beforehand. And this was a case where we're, what we're calling frost seeding the red clover into the, into the winter wheat. So uh, you plant a, a winter wheat in the, the previous fall, you come back in in the spring and you top dress or you top, you overseed the, the winter wheat with the, with the, win, uh, the red clover. The red clover just kind of hangs out in that understory. So when you take off that winter wheat, you've got a nice thick stand of red clover. The nice thing about this system too, is that we're gonna go ahead and terminate, we're growing, then we get enough growth of that red clover in the fall that we're gonna go ahead and terminate it in the fall also. So we're not letting it grow into the spring, but because we feel we're growing enough nitrogen in the fall that, that it's worth it. 
And this, and this demonstrates, at least in this one example, that it does. So here in the blue is the corn yields, then the corn yields following that red clover cover crop versus no, uh, no cover crop in the red. And so two things are happening here. And I've drawn the lines here where yields plateaued. So yields plateaued with, with following cover crop at 203 bushels versus no cover crop, 176 bushels. So the first thing is we're getting a yield bump by having that legume kind of in rotation, so to speak, with that corn wheat. The other thing is that yields plateaued with a lot less nitrogen. So in this, according to the, our, our statistics, we're seeing a 46 pound nitrogen credit with that. So we're getting, we're getting a double benefit. So more yield and more nitrogen supplied. Question? You're talking about nitrogen all the time, but you're not telling us how you apply this nitrogen. Oh, I'm sorry. That's fair enough. So in all, in all of these studies, uh, we're working, in all these studies that I've presented here, they're all, we're all working in no-till systems. And so we're top, dress, we're top dressing urea that's coated with a urease inhibitor, applied uh, near or within a week after planting. That's it, one done. One application, yep, one application timing. And, and that's, we've seen pretty good results with that. These are, um, um, you know, we're a little bit cooler conditioned, so I think we can get away with that a little bit more. And these are not tile drained either. Uh, in any case, but in the, I'm sorry, but in the manure studies, we're actually applying in season. Uh, we're applying later into the season as a side dress, or waiting until corn's about uh, six inches tall. Question in the back? Oh, question up front? Someone's pointing. So, so your trials, uh, long-term no-till, mm -hmm. how many years cover? Oh, and I'm sorry, yeah, so I, I just jumped right in the middle of all this, didn't I? So the question was, how many years of cover crop? So the, all of these studies here are all looking at single year effects of cover cropping, right? So in, some, in a lot of cases, these are the, this is the first year of cover cropping. And so we're, we're moving, corn silage is typically grown in rotation um, just because it's so obviously a lot of carbon removal from the system. So something like that would be a single year effect. So all the work that we have now that I presented is on a single year effect, the first time you're growing a cover crop and the effect on, on nitrogen management. But it does, but you're, I think you're probably your point is that we could use a lot more long-term nitrogen, um, long-term trials for cover crops. And I absolutely agree, absolutely. And we're trying. But even then, we've only, you know, even our long-term trials to date are still only three or four years old. So we're, we're working on it. Um, so with that, I love legumes in rotation. If you can figure out how to get legumes as cover crops uh, into your rotation, there is a real effect. It's a nitrogen supply effect. And... Uh, and, I've, and I'm trying to figure out how to get more, more of these into our rotations in Wisconsin. So uh, to sum up, what nutrient management adjustments, uh, adjustments should you make when using cover crops? I think if you're using, um, if you have grass cover crops, I would certainly recommend using nitrogen in the starter fertilizer. I think there's a potential for a little bit of tie up. I think that can, that can certainly help. Um, don't expect there to be residual nitrogen. So if you're in a system where you typically have a lot of nitrogen left over into the next spring, the cover crop will take that out. So it is possible that your nitrogen requirement may go up a little bit. That's possible. And especially if there's excessive growth um, with, if you're combining that with a manure application, um, we're gonna probably have to reduce the nitrogen credit from that manure. The, the, we'll have to reduce our expectation of nitrogen supply. And I put how much, I don't know yet. Um, but uh, we got to figure out that it, there's, it's a real effect. I just don't know how accurate I can get with, with that prediction. But we'll continue working on that. With radish, no change. Um, if it's just a pure standard radish, no change in your nitrogen adjustments. And then with legumes, certainly take 40 to 60 pounds of nitrogen if you have good growth. And I think there's some cases that we've seen we can get up to 100 pounds of nitrogen. Um, if you can get a, if you can get a really large stand going, so um, but I think for most cases, at least in Wisconsin, but with with our winter kill situation, if you're using crimson clover or stuff like that, 40 to 60 pounds is a is pretty conservative.